Hello and welcome to lesson number three in our family search uh, using family search series. Tonight we're going to talk about indexing. Um, it's a great module. I love uh, I love indexing because it's a way that anybody can in 20 to 30 minutes a day, a week, um, whatever works for them, but they can do some work that can help people around the globe, fam fellow family historians, find information about ancestors that they haven't been able to find. So we're going to start off, we're going to talk about a couple of terms that are important to understand while we, uh, when we do indexing. And then I'm going to jump right into the indexing module family search. I'm going to show you how to, how to pick a batch, how to look to see if that batch is uh, um, maybe too hard for your skill level at the at the time and what to do about that. Um, but you're gonna know, you're gonna learn some tools that we have in the indexing module that even if you're a brand new beginner, um, you can use to help you understand how to press forward, how to answer certain questions and how to solve certain problems in there. The goal is by the end of this 15, 20 minute um, educational video that you can get into indexing and uh, know how to get help to be able to complete a uh, project. So indexing, family history, indexing, let's move right on. Let's, let's start with a couple of terms. The very first term we have to understand is what in the world is indexing? It's one of those, it's one of those terms that um, we, we throw around a lot in, uh, in, a, in the genealogical realms, especially even within the church we uh, talk about indexing, but a lot of times people don't understand what indexing means in the context of family history. So we have this, I have an example here. This is a, a scanned picture, a digital picture of a 1920 census record. Indexing is the process of taking this human readable form like this, extracting identifying information and then putting that information into a form format that the computer can search and recall this information so that people can search for a name and they can find this record, this census record as part of what it is. So it's making available information about all these people to anybody that has uh, internet access or has access to family search and the database. So for instance, in this case, we have one line on here that talks about Julia Jennings. Once this record is indexed and it's put into the database for family search, anyone that is looking for Julia Jennings would receive this as one of the, as one of the returns um, in their search. Now, why is indexing so important? And there's two reasons. One is very, very obvious. Okay. When you are searching for ancestors to put in your family tree with the goal, hopefully the goal to get their temple ordinances done, indexed information makes it possible for you to find people that you might be looking for. For instance, if Julia Jennings was a long lost ancestor of yours and you knew that she existed but could never find much information on her, all of a sudden this information gets um, indexed and now she's now her information is available to you. So that's the first thing is to be able to help us find people that we're looking for that we can connect them in our family tree. The second the second reason is a little is a little is not as obvious, but it goes back to that first lesson where we talked about talk, talked about the goal of family tree to be able to connect every connect people and represent them with accurate records and then connect them correctly to their to their families. And so in order to do that, one of the things we had talked about is we have this concept of helping to create an identity for each person. So in order for me to prove that this Julia Jennings is the relative that I was looking for, or is the Julie Jennings that I said is, if I begin to attach historical records like census records and birth records and marriage records and all these other things, then anybody who's looking at this record in family search would agree this is the Julia Jennings that I say it is and not the Julia Jennings that maybe they think they think it is. So there's two great, great, great um, impacts for uh, indexing. 
And there's, this is a massive effort that is going on, not only within family search, but within every genealogical database, there are private collections that are being uh, imaged and indexed for availability to people searching for them um, at, at a rate that we have never seen before. And this is one of the reasons also I say, I'll say that family history work never is really done. We can get the bulk of our information in there, but because the databases are constantly growing, there's always the possibility that more information will be made available to us. And so we have to realize that we can't really be done. We can be in maintenance mode where we're looking for more information to add to the tree or more identity information or historical information to add to the people we have in our tree. But we can't just say, I'm done and walk away and go do something else. Sorry, <laughs> sorry if that's bad news to you. But that's, uh, that's really the least the way I, I look at it. But you can see this is a little dated information. This was a year in review of 2019 for Family Search. They had 6.3 billion searchable records online um, at, at the end of 2019. Uh, just in one year, 123.6 million new records were indexed. So that is, that is 123.6 million more pieces of information available than were available um, the year before. So that's the work that we're doing. It's exciting. Um, it's exciting. It's exciting. And it's very, very valuable. So why do we call it indexing? Um, indexes historically are specific search keys that are used to find information um, in databases. We don't, we don't put all of the information in from my record, especially a record like this. We're going to put in key information that people may be searching for or that needs to be recalled quickly for part of a search. It's a database thing. Um, but anyways, that's why it's, that's kind of the roots of, of, uh, of the indexing of what the indexing is now today to us. Okay, so a couple of important terms while we're talking about um, um, family search and indexing. Family search um, works with a group of projects. Uh, project is a collection of historical records that have, a, this, uh, have in common a time and a place. Like for instance, a project is, would be to index all the records from that 1920 census that we just that I just showed you for Julia for Julia Jennings. So those projects then when they come in and sometimes family search works in collaboration with other partners or other organizations to help get this information on uh, in, in the databases and on the online. But what family search will do is we'll take a project and it's going to break it down into bite sized pieces so it's easy to uh, easy for people to take and to work on. Um, at a reasonable pace, and that's called a batch. A batch is taking the project and we break it down into batches of one or two images of the historical forms that can usually, the indexing should be able to be done in 20 to 30 minutes. Now, when you're first starting out, it may take you, it's gonna take you a little bit longer, but you're gonna get to the point where you're, where you're an old pro at this and you're gonna fly through some of these very, very rapidly. And there may be some projects or some batches that you find, you may be able to get through two batches in, in uh, 20 to 30 minutes or three batches in an hour um, as you get, uh, as you get uh, proficiency and understand um, how to do it, how to do it. And batches are made up of records a record is the information that's specific to the person about the historical event it was. So the record I showed you on the census about Julia Jennings, she was one entry of a line of 40 or 50 other records. So an image, an image can contain multiple records or it might not. There may be, there may be, um, I'm going to show you some examples of a batch of birth records where every image is one child. But I'm also going to show you a, um, a, uh, a uh, birth or christening, some christening examples um, where it's a ledger that there's 10 or 12 names, uh, 10 or 12 records on one, uh, on one, uh, on one page of the batch or one of the one of the documents of the batch. So it's important to understand how many records um, you are working with when you're when you're going through it. And we'll we're going to talk in much greater depth about that actually right now. I wanted to point out here we do have a we do have a, a YouTube YouTube channel. You've probably found it because you're watching this replay that I'm recording. Wow. So let me stop this. 
And now I am going, I'm going into family search. There we go. So the very first thing when we get into family search is you're going to need to sign in. You do have to have an account with family search to sign in. It, I don't believe, I don't believe it has to be a church, a, an account that is uh, related to a membership record. I think you, I just think anybody can do indexing. I'm actually, matter of fact, I'm actually pretty sure of that. But just anybody can do an indexing. It isn't a, uh, it isn't limited to people with a membership, uh, with membership record associated with their account. All right, so I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go up into indexing. I'm gonna do web indexing. And then it brings me to this, to this, uh, uh, to this screen. I'm actually gonna turn on, uh, I'm going to turn on this so it's a little bit easier for you to see. So, so this screen is broken into multiple po multiple places. This first one we're gonna we're gonna spend some the bulk of our time in my batches. So let's talk about some of these others. This one here under my indexing totals, I bring this up. I wanted to show this because it's important that you understand that in indexing there's actually two two user roles. Um, for anybody who's just starting out, um, which would be, I think it's, I think it's a th under a thousand records indexed. You're just, you're just indexing. You're going to go in and you're going to do what I'm going to show. But for people who have done more indexing, you get to this point where you can actually review the indexing that has been done by others. And and I, I point this out to you because I know that when you when people get started in indexing, they're so worried about making a mistake that they, they get very intimidated um, uh, to do anything unless they're absolutely 100% sure. And so I want to bring up uh, bring up two points on this. First, firstly, um, we're not asked to be perfect. We're just asked to do our extremely best. And there's times that you or other people you're going to see are going to make a judgment call that turns out to be, to be wrong. And then there's going to be some that are right. And that's okay. We're meant to do the very best that we can, but you can be safe in the fact that there is going, when you get done indexing and you submit your batch, what happens is, is somebody else is gonna come along, someone that's more experienced, they're gonna review that batch to, uh, to try to catch any mistakes. So you, have, you do have a little bit of a safety net, but I'm also gonna show you some tools that we have within the indexing, index, indexer screens um, that really, really helps us feel, helps at least helps me feel more comfortable and the work that I'm doing. Um, down here, I've got messages that, that they may come specifically to an individual, like these two batch expired. These are some batches I had set aside to, sh to show during a recording and I didn't get to them fast enough. They they expired, which means they, they got returned um, into the pool for somebody else to do. But there might also be messages that are to everybody like this new to indexing. This is about new features and things like that, okay? You can, if you want, down here, set a, a goal, a monthly goal or whatever, and track yourself to it. You can see that I have a goal of 50 and I'm doing really poorly this month. I need to, I need to do better. Um, but this is where we go. When we start talking about, about doing a batch, you're gonna go in here, you're gonna hit find batch, find batches, find a batch. Very first thing I'm going to tell you to do. Um, first thing I'm going to tell you to do is you're going to ignore on the on the left side of the screen the difficulty level, um, that beginning, intermediate, and advanced thing. You can search based on that, but I'll tell you, it's kind of misleading. There isn't um, it isn't uh, there's not a good good indication of what a beginning level is versus an advanced level is. I've I've done projects that are beginning projects that were very that were very hard. At least they're hard for me. Um, and I've done advanced projects that were very easy and quick for me. Um, I'm going to show you how to look at it. There's a really easy way to assess a batch um, and determine whether it's something you feel comfortable doing. Because if, if you don't feel comfortable doing, you can peek at it, you can look at it, and you can return it. And then somebody else will do it. So it's, so it's a lot better than this. So I just check, I would say, check all of these difficulty levels. So all the projects, all the all the projects, and these are projects, all the projects show up as options for you to select. The other thing I want to point out here is for those of you who are bilingual or multilingual, um, you can also search in a lot of different languages. And, 
and you can not only bless lives in English, but you can bless lives in, in, in whatever other languages you tend to do. So, so please, if you're getting into indexing, um, absolutely do some, in, do some in, in English, but make sure you try some out in, in other languages as well, because we really, really, really need your language skills to be able to do that. But anyways, I'm going to stick with English because quite candidly, I'm often challenged just in English and I don't know any other languages. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna go here. I'm just gonna pick this top one. These projects that are in here that tend to be shadowed, grayed in here, are ones that are they're they're automatically prioritized brought to the top because they're they, they've got a priority on them right now. So I'm going to uh, walk you through here. By default, you're going to check one batch out at a time, which is great if you want to take a peek at one and see if it's something you want to do. But if you find a batch that is really good for you, really easy for you to work through, you can actually when you come back in here, you can actually pick a bunch of them to be able to do so that you have them now watch out, they do expire and get returned if you don't, if you don't touch them in a, in a cup. I, I don't know what the time limit is. It's less than a week, about a week, if not, if less. The ones that got, the ones that expired for me were um, from last Wednesday and, and this is a, you know, this is a Monday. So it's, you know, a couple of, couple of days uh, on there. So don't take too many, um, but if you're going to do them, great, do it. So we're going into, I'm going to go in here, I'm going to click on index. First thing you're going to see, um, you might see here, is in a, um, a note or information specific about this batch or this project. This one says that this is this is this contains private records and information, including information about living persons, and that we need to basically saying you need to treat this stuff with uh, with care. It is private information. Don't share it. Don't capture information about it. Don't. Don't do anything with it, you know, treat it according to uh, Wisconsin law. And if you don't want to do that, you can hit back and go find it a batch. That's what it says. So I don't have a problem, problem with that. I'm going to hit OK. So there are really two steps in indexing. The very first one is really, really high level, really basic. And what, it, and what you see right here right now is it's asking me a very simple question. I'm looking at the image. And I see that there's two images in this batch. I'm looking at this image and I'm asked to answer the question. Should this image be indexed? Meaning, is there any information that's viable, that's valuable? Is it readable? Is it something that you can continue, you can move forward to go in? Most, most often this is yes. I have had times where I get a, I get a blank or a, a smeared page or something like that, which in that case I would then hit the drop down box and and maybe hit no 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 extractable information and then I won't then you won't get the get an input form with this. But this is this is good. So I'm gonna say yes to this one and I'm gonna do that for every image in the batch. So that one's a good one as well. I'm gonna hit yes. Go ahead. Now depending upon your view, um, some of this sometimes it retain it kind of retains your settings. Sometimes this thing's going to show some pop-ups um, when you come in, uh, project information and others. That's very valuable, and I'm actually that's what I'm actually going to do. So, so let's say you're just getting started and you go, okay, I'm going to take a shot at this intermediate project on Wisconsin births, and you pick it. You go through the first step and say, yes, that's extractable. Yes, that's extractable, and then boom, it drops you into this, and you look at this, and you look at this form on the left, and you're going, aha. Now what? Okay, don't worry. Don't panic. Don't panic. Um, this icon right here, and this window might be open for you if you're new in here. I think it opens by default. Project instructions is, is very, very useful because what it's going to do, it's going to give you prod batch specific information, and then it's going to give you information in general about um, best practices about how to handle certain situations. Invaluable, invaluable, know where this is. Read through the whole one the very, very first time, first couple of times you do this. So you're aware of the information that's in here. So if you run into the situation, you come back and you can come back and do, come back and look at it. So this first one just tells you what I, what I, what I just said about, you're gonna review them. 
what I love. This boy, this one saves, this one saves, uh, saves me so many times. They're going to give you examples of filled out forms and how those forms relate to the data entry fields. Okay, so I'm going to click on this one. And it's going to open this in a new tab. So I will always leave this tab open while I'm doing, doing the inputting because I can kick back and forth if I'm not sure what what a field really means or what stand, what, it, what it's asking for, right? So I see these things and these correlate, this correlates often to the order of information that you're going to be filling in, in the form. So when you're assessing this, you're gonna look at the form. Is there something that's, that, that you feel comfortable with? For instance, if there's lots of, lots of really bad, nasty handwriting, you may not feel so, so comfortable doing that, but a form like this, there's a lot of information, but the majority of it is pretty clear, is all clear information. You may feel comfortable doing that. So assess, assess the project, assess what you're asked, being asked to do, how it lines up, right? And then you can go in here and look at this and see how you, you know, see what the fields are that you're going to be asked to, to do, okay? So I'm going to go back to instructions because one of the couple of things in here that are really important there's this, after this section, there's a section on what to remember about this project. So this is more information specific to this project. It tells you that the purple question mark is your friend, right? So if I go back over here and I look at this, it says form type, what the, what is that? And I pop and I hit that and it says, oh, this form is, it's either a certificate or a charge out. And then it may give you some information on how to determine, or it may be, or in that case, usually this cases like this, it's fairly obvious. But when you get down into here, for instance, child's given name, well, what's the difference between a given name and a surname? It tells me that, it gives me that information. So quite often just knowing that what's on that purple, purple question mark and what and the example example form fill out gets you a long way to get getting these fields, so getting these fields done. Okay, so you can read through here. What's also really helpful is general index and guidelines, because they're going to recount for you some of the standard formats that these forms are going to kind of force you to enter data in, in a generally accepted format for dates and places and things like that. But this is also going to tell you things because sometimes in these forms, there's extra information. And so there's certain information you, they want you to index and there's certain information they don't want you to index. And so they're going to call these types of things out. And they're talking about what's given names. It says, do not correct misspellings or expand abbreviations. Very important. We, we My tendency is I look at these things and I want to fill in the blanks. I want to solve the puzzles. Um, a lot of times it's going to be very specific. Some of these instructions are going to say, if it isn't in this field specifically, don't take information from other parts of the form or don't assume anything. Our job is to transcribe what is there from the, from the image into the data entry form. Okay, very important, right? So it says, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't index, you know, names like this, uh, how to handle aliases, here's information on surnames, place names, how to index individuals whose names aren't fully recorded. If you familiarize yourself with these instructions, especially this section, you're going to run into cases in a project and go, wait a minute, I read, I read about how to do that. And you're going to go find it here and you're going to find your answer in here. You handwriting help, handwriting help. There's a great little help up here. This little pin, right? handwriting gives you examples, gives you examples that kind of get you closer to some of the typical applications of, of these um, typical, uh, the typical, uh, uh, implementation, yeah, the way these those are, All right? So we go hand, hand cross out. One of the things I want to tell you right here, unreadable information. Sometimes you get into these, especially handwritten ones or forms that begin to fade a little bit and it's really, really hard to make out um, what, it, what it's being said, especially in handwriting. Um, it's been handwriting. You can maybe pick out the first couple of letters and the last couple of letters, but there might be one or two that you just don't know what to do. You don't skip that field. What you do is, is you come back in here and you say, well, if you have one unreadable info, one, one in unreadable letter, you're going to give a question mark. If there's multiple characters, you're going to do this. If it's one whole field that's unreadable, you're going to mark it a specific way. Again, right? Again, 
This, a lot of this information is here. Read the instructions, do the very, very best you can. And especially, er, you know, and early on, you have, a, you have uh, resources to, uh, like your board family history consultants or the state family history consultants to be able to help you out. Okay, so, so this is, so let's say, so let me, I've gone through this. I'm getting started. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is just a little much for me to get started on. I don't really feel comfortable doing this, this one. So you go up here to batch, you go up here to batch, you hit drop down here and you say return batch. Now that batch goes back into the larger pool and somebody else will work on it. Somebody else will fulfill it, right? So great, great, no harm with all. That's, that's the best way that I know and the way people have told me how to assess whether you wanna do a batch. Check it out, check it out, run through it, look at it and then return it if you're not, uh, if you're not comfortable with it. So, all right, so let's go through a couple of things. One of the things, I'm gonna to go to this one. Um, uh, this one I think was an advanced batch. Um, yeah, I get, a, I get a project reminder that this is classified as advanced. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So now, so I get this, right? You can see this. I can, some of the controls I have, I can zoom in. I can zoom in, zoom out. That's really helpful. Um, I one of the things I love, especially when I'm dealing with handwriting like this, be able to, whoops, be able to adjust contrast and brightness, but I can also invert the image because sometimes zooming in and inverting the image helps me to read it. So you have a lot of tools around that. One of the tools that I find really helpful when you're doing tabular data like this, because you look at this, this is one image, but I have multiple records. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight records. I have eight individual entries on one image. And it's, and so I have one image, but I have eight records. Okay. So that's, that's that. But what, so one of the things that helps, that helps me while I'm, uh, while I'm doing this type of tabular data, while I'm doing this tabular data, because what you're going to do is you're going to go through, let me show you, this type of data is what you're going to have is you're going to have one image with multiple entry forms. An entry form represents the data from a record that we're going to index, right? So right off the bat, right, this is the very first, first one. This is an entry type of burial death records. It's from the Littleport Parish, which is information up here. And then you go down through here and you fill things in. Now, if the record, if the record is asking for the entry form is asking for information that doesn't exist or is blank, you mark blank. And the marking of the blank is either this field here or uh, for me, it's a, it's a control, it's a control B, right? Um, because every field needs to have something, especially if it has an asterisk on it, it has to have something or else it will um, the system will not allow you to turn it turn in the batch when you think you're when you think you're done. But then I go through all the names. I go through all of this. But this is this is just her. Right? And so now I'm still on the same image. But then I go to the second entry form, and now I have all that same information for John Little. Now as I'm going back and forth, flipping pages, it's really easy to lose my place. And so if you go to data entry, one of the hidden little tools that I love is called show ruler. So now I can say, oh, okay, I'm working on this one, John Little, so forth and so on. And then I get done with John and I go to the third entry. I pull this down to the third entry and I fill all that in. Okay. And so I get down and I, I get all the way down here to, I get down to eight, get down to record eight or my, or my form eight. Right, which is Hannah, right down here. I've got I've got all eight done. I'm I'm out of records. I've done all my records. I have no additional images. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to return the batch. I want or I want to submit the batch. I'm done. I'm I've done it. I want to send it back in 
so that a reviewer can review it. And I want to show you, I did this specifically because I wanted to show you um, a kind of a common error uh, here when you when you when we get into this that you need to be you can be mindful of. If I hit this, if I hit this, it's going to say it's going to do a quality check, meaning are my are did I fill in all the all the fields that I'm supposed to fill in, all the required fields, everything done that I should done. I'm going to run the run the quality check, and this is going to blow up, right? This one's going to blow up, and it's saying 22 issue 22 issues remaining. Now this could be it, this could be anything. This is a pretty generic error. Um, this could be this really could be anything. Um, if you had a a if you had a required field that wasn't filled in, for instance, you can do that. I'm going to show you that on another on another form in a minute. Um, but this one tells me something. I've got 22 issues remaining, and it's very generic. What it's what it's barking about is the fact that I have. If you look at this, I go to nine, I was at eight, I was at eight, it stopped at eight, right? It stopped it, it did eight, and it erred on the ninth record, right? It erred right there on the ninth record. That's because I have 30 entry forms associated with this image. When, the, when this project, when this batch was created, that was just what they did. They created a bunch of default entry forms. Sometimes you have too many, sometimes you don't have enough. Okay. And that's what this is complaining about. It's saying I have a bunch of blank entry forms because I'm done. I'm done. I don't have any more data. So what you need to do is you're going to need to delete. You're going to need to delete the empty forms. And this is pretty terrifying because all this hard work, you don't want to delete something. Right. But you're going to go up here. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to go back to my last record that I had, my last entry form. There we go, there's Hannah. I'm gonna go up here, I'm gonna hit delete. And it's gonna come back and say, what do you want to delete? The current entry form or all blank entries? Well, I don't wanna delete entry eight because that's got data in it. So I'm gonna delete all blank entries. I'm gonna hit this, boom. Now you notice here, I'm now I only have eight of eight. I'm eight of eight. And another sign that I'm good is at the bottom of the last form that I'm putting data in. I get this button that says submit batch or create entry nine. Let's say I had eight forms and I had three more entries at the bottom of this. I would have eight entries, but say I had 11 or 12 names. I could also then create an entry form for the data that, that I have. So sometimes when you're doing this type of data, when you've got multiple records, Sometimes you're going to wind up having to delete blank entry forms, or you may need to create entry forms based upon what the, what the default was for the project. But I, I'm not going to do that. I want to submit the batch. It's going to say it did its quality check. It says your issue, no issues found. I'm going to say, I'm going to submit my batch. We celebrate. Um, we celebrate. I'm going to go back to web indexing. Now, one of the things you'll see is this, if you paid, if you were seeing anything, you notice that this number jumped up by eight because you get count. What this counts is the number of records that you did. And there was eight records in that batch. And so I jumped up. So, so that's all, that's, that's interesting. Now, let me show you, let me show you. So this is another one. This is one of those Wisconsin birth um, projects, batches. Okay, I've got two images. I've got two images here, okay? This is entry one of one, okay? Now, if I, um, meaning I've got one entry form on the second image, that's what I'm meaning here, okay? I get through here and I think I'm, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. Uh, quite often an error that you'll get when you're first starting is, is you think you filled a, rec a field in that you didn't um, because it's real easy to occur sometimes. Okay, so things like this, right? Two issues are remaining, right? Mother's current surname is a required field. Okay, all right, I understand. Then it's gonna ask, well, okay, this, this field is blank. That's a required, that's a required field. So I said, okay. So I'm going to, um, um, right, so what I'm, oh, and what it did is when I did that is it blanked those out. Um, I'm gonna close this for a minute. Right? One of the points that I wanna make is, my rhubarb. One of the points I was going to make that I made earlier is 
Just because the form asks for the information doesn't mean it exists. So you notice there was a question there about mother's current surname. Mother's current surname. Okay. Now we could, because here's her maiden name, Pollock. Okay, Pollock. Now you would think that we we could just we might just assume that her surname or her married name is the same as her husband's. We can't. We, the, our instructions are, and it's in those instructions, not to assume that. If there isn't, if there isn't a field specifically that, that has her as has her surname as her husband, same as her husband's name, we have to mark it blank. We have to mark it blank. And so let me show you what that looks like. A form that has that information in it. Okay. So you see this, here's mother's maiden name, mother's current surname, 17. If I find it in this form, in this example form, it actually has an area where it refers to Mrs. Frank versus Mrs. Mrs. Schmidt, which is the maiden name. So um, that's one of the things that that we need to always be mindful of is, is when we're doing these records, we're not, we're not um, assuming data. For instance, it asks for the, the sex of the child. If it isn't marked on the form, we don't say, oh, well, that's a girl's name, so it's a female. We transcribe the information that exists on the record, okay? And so um, I went ahead and Going to did that because I corrected the bat, corrected that in the quality check. Another another set of confetti ex, um, celebration on here, and now I'm clear and I've got more names done. So that's that's indexing. So let me show you something. If you need help when you're you know if when you're logged in, you're trying stuff, it's not working. You get frustrated. You're looking for help. Now that you're logged into Family Search, you can always go here and go, go um, to contact us. And it's gonna give you based on, on who you are or where you're at, um, it'll give you names of help, even if it's just the support center for family search. So you can get help, uh, you can get help that way for sure. Now, the one last thing I wanted to show you just very quickly, I know I'm running, running long on time as I usually do, I'm sorry. But I wanted to show you there's another type of way to help with indexing. Um, if I go here, this is the BYU Family History Lab. You can see this is found at fhtlbyu.edu. And these, these, these uh, folks write applications that integrate with Family Search. And one of the things that they've done in here is they've created a reverse indexing application. If I click on this, it explains what in the world is reverse indexing. Um, so indexing the machine learning algorithms, we try to get to uh, a point where it can actually automate, the computer could, could automate and read certain forms and index them automatically. Um, and, we're able to do that to some degree, but handwriting is extremely difficult to be able to do. So reverse indexing actually is an application that allows you as an indexer to go in and help teach the algorithms in FamilySearch how to more accurately recognize handwriting by going through here and saying, oh, there's gonna give you a surname and you're gonna go down here and you're gonna mark all the examples of what you think matches that, that handwriting. And it's an interesting way to give back by helping to make the system smarter to make our lives all easier again. So um, that's, that, is, uh, that is, as they say, is that. That's what I, what, what I have for you. I hope that was interesting, but get in, um, get into, uh, get into uh, format or indexing it's a great way just just to help. Like I said, it's a great way to help uh, help out to uh, help out people all over the globe to find family members. And you never know, there are stories on occasion where indexers actually come across 
family information that they've been looking for as well. I have a great testimony of, of this work and the blessings it is to uh, be connected, to become connected and to understand who we're, where we're from and who, we, who our ancestors were. Have a great time and a safe, and a safe uh, month. Thanks.